Guys, welcome to another episode of The Pulse. You know how we do here. We bring on people who've got great stories. And today is no different, except that I've been smiling and, and fanboying a little bit because MC Light is a legend. And there's not a lot of opportunities you get to talk to people who are doing those types of things, whose music that you like, but who also whose career you have followed. So MC Light, thank you so much and welcome to The Pulse. Absolutely, thank you. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It continues to be a distinguished career, but let's go back to, to it kind of getting started. I'm always fascinated by that, like your background, how you break in and became such a trailblazer. What proves to be a testament all the time when I share this story is that I was prepared. And for anything that you want to get into, I would say long before you even know that it can ever become a reality, just start to prepare for it. So I had a rhyme book with a whole lot of rhymes. I, I met with a coach who kind of had me singing salt and pepper songs with my brush in the middle of the living room. Um, he taught me how to come from the diaphragm when I speak because if I didn't, then I'd talk like this. And people are so accustomed to me talking the other way, they always think something's wrong. And so in any case, I rhymed with this guy in school and he wind up uh, coming on uh, like much later and asking me, did I want to take advantage of an opportunity? And they were putting together a record label and having people, you know, come in and perform and stuff. Did I want to go? And I said, yeah. So I, jo I jumped on the Staten Island Ferry. I headed off to Staten Island in the dead of winter. I got there. There was a studio in the basement and I went. And it was like nine guys waiting there for, for me to get there. And they were like, okay, what you got? And they were all looking at me. And I was 16 at the time. And um, I pulled out that notebook that I had been preparing. And that was actually the first song that was ever recorded was I Cram to Understand You, which was yeah. a song I wrote when I was about 12 or 13 years old. And we've had a couple people. Big Daddy Kane was on, uh, DMC was on, Tretch was on. They all tell the mm -hmm. stories of, of New York kind of being like that. Like if you wanted to break into it, you were prepared. You had to be ready to go at any moment, sometimes battling, sometimes just performing. That was your reality too. The moment of opportunity was always there. And because it was ripe, it was ready for the taking. It was like this huge thing called hip hop that was sweltering and getting bigger and bigger, but you could still find your way through it. Like case in point, um, the business of it hadn't become so big. So I could do a showcase. I had a management company back in the early 90s. I had a showcase uh, at one of the clubs and I could call up the Source magazine and say, I need you there. And guess what? They'd be there. I could call up Word Up magazine or Write On or whatever. So now the business has become so big, some of us have to convince those same publications that we're worthy of space on the pages of their magazines when we are the ones that made their magazines. So yeah, at that time, it was open, it was blossoming. And anybody, if you were ready and interesting and had something to say, there was space and room for you to do so. There may have been space, but it still took people like you to be trailblazers. Like you weren't, you weren't the yeah. first, but you were the first, mm -hmm. I think you were the first who did the, uh, a solo album, first woman who did a solo rap album in, entirely. So you were still kind of kicking down doors, even if all those opportunities existed. Sure. <laughs> I'm in agreement with you. Is As long as you were interesting and right. had something to say that was poignant to the subject matter that seemed to attract a young listener. You talk about Naughty and you talk about Big Daddy Kane and Fresh Prince and Chuck D and Karis One and Heavy D and just all of these people that were very uh, original and unique. There, there weren't many laid down before is what I'm saying. So right. if I come to the table with the name Light at that time, it's early in the game. Nobody has it. Right. You come to the game with, with the name Heavy, Heavy D, nobody has that name. I just, <laughs> a year ago, I heard of a guy named Heavy. I was like, how the hell can you be heavy? <laughs> we already have a heavy. Even if he is deceased, that's even more of a reason for us to protect the integrity of, of his name and who he was. When did yeah. it become a big deal? Like, when did it move from, I've got my book, I'm prepared, I'm, I'm doing shows, to, 
whoa, I, I'm, I'm on to something. Well, I'm on to something I think came with the record deal. And I hadn't done a show before that. Prior to that, um, I was just a writer, a, a storyteller. And then, you know, little by little, my first performance, um, I tell people was at a club in Brooklyn. I got $100 and I had to give $25 of it to my manager. But I had $75 from doing something that I would have done for free. You know, and so moving on to bigger tours, being, you know, being on tours with Public Enemy and Fresh Prince, Kid and Play, all, all of these people is like, oh, okay, I'm arriving. And then I think it was the first nomination for Roughneck, the first Grammy nomination. I was like, okay, this is real. All mm -hmm. y'all would be there. Like you could be in a stadium all day. You know, with the greats <laughs> just out there performing all day. Yeah. Like being the mm -hmm. other side of that must have been pretty cool. Yeah, totally. Whenever you were able to be in the midst of those you looked up to, those that inspired you. You know, as a kid, I had posters on my wall that looked like wallpaper. You could barely see the paint because I just had Dougie Fresh and Prince and Michael Jackson, the Jacksons, Sheila E., you know, all all of Salt and Pepper, Heavy D, Karis One, all of them were all over. It got to a point where I was hanging them from the ceiling. Yeah. All those names you mentioned who were on your wall, at some point mm -hmm. you you become one of them. Like you're on other people's walls. Yeah. Like you're, yeah. you're one yeah, of those people. Yeah, that's crazy. Right. Like what mm -hmm. did that feel like? You know, is was there a moment when it is like my peers, or excuse me, the people I looked up to are now my peers. It's no greater feeling to know that it's possible. So when I talk to young people, whatever their vision is for their lives, to really believe in it and prepare for it. I remember going to a print show when he did the 21 shows at the Forum in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking to the back to go to Sheila E's dressing room and the door opens and I bump right into Prince. And it, it was right after the show and he was like, oh, I can't believe you're here. I was like, yes. He said, I would have pulled you up on stage. I was just looking at him like, like what? are you crazy? And like, you're right. Because he was pulling up people on stage during all of those shows. But then just to be friends with, you know, Sheila E. And we spent a, a large amount of time on the Grammy uh, board as part of the LA chapter together. And so I had both of them on my wall when I was 14, you know, 13, 14. And now to just be um, amongst these great musicians and contributors to this culture and community of music is great. Coming up, she's still making hits, but now she just does it because she loves to. So this album is a culmination of all of the many years and the wisdom that I've been able to um, accrue. Yeah, it just feels free. Are the artists today appropriately respectful? Do they recognize the greats who, who paved the way like you did? It is the ones that will go back beyond. You know, it's like the people who have relationships with their grandparents and their great aunts and great uncles and find the reverence and respect for those people. And uh, if I liken it to hip hop, it's, you know, Rhapsody doesn't have to just look towards Eve or towards Missy, or towards Foxy, or towards Lil' Kim, as we go further and further down the line, when I came into the game at 87, you know, she can get wisdom from someone who has been in it for as long as I have, which is why we completely have a, a great sisterhood, because I'm able to impart what it is that I know, and she's able to inspire with what it is that she creates that's new. You, you still love it? I do. I do. It's the only reason why I would be in the studio. I certainly don't need to be in there to make money or uh, sell records because I'm not really, that's not what I'm really after. I'm after um, what we used to have back in the days, which were bona fide fan clubs. And that's being able to get closer to the fans and have them get closer to you and give an experience that, uh, that they haven't had in, in quite some time. That's what I'm after this go round because I, I'm i gonna put out a flurry of music, but you know, 
my my dreams are to become a very well accomplished and seasoned director. And so once I, I do this, I'll be able to give my time to that. You have actually a new uh, new album coming out. Are we still calling them albums? You, yeah. you have a new. I, I do. <laughs> okay. So it... Our albums take time. They they take time to cultivate. And so yes, I am working on an album that will be presented in a digital format as well as a physical format. Tell us about this this new album. Well, the album is entitled One of One. It's exciting. I'm doing it with uh, Warren Campbell, who is a multi-Grammy winner and uh, nominated musician. Um, he's also my pastor, which makes it really exciting because I get to come in and be 100% of my new self. And I don't have somebody looking at me saying, well, why don't you say that? Well, why can't you say it this way? It's just coming from a really real, genuine and spiritual place. And so it's uplifting hip hop. It's telling hip hop, it's truthful hip hop. And so for me, it it's just been a breeze and very, not only enlightening, but also um, stepping into a new space with creating with this newfound energy and knowingness. Did you feel like when you have that level of success so young that people tried to keep you there? You said your new self, you're getting to express that. Uh, was that something people pushed back against, like letting you continue to Oh evolve? no, it didn't exist. <laughs> it okay. didn't exist. I just, I just wasn't new. Uh, you know, I would, <laughs> but it's very easy as an MC to um, fall into a braggadocious space, which many of us do. For me, it's always been storytelling. It's always been wanting to enlighten some young folk um, to uh, enlighten them to what is happening in this day and time as it relates to things that could impede or stop their growth, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was drugs. So I had an anti-drug message. I crammed to understand you. My first song was addressing the drug epidemic, crack happening in Brooklyn, heroin happening in Harlem, and who knows what else happening in other places. So this album is a culmination of all of the many years and the wisdom that I've been able to um, accrue, um, if you can accrue wisdom. Um, yeah, it just feels free. Some of the people you're working with, you know, you, you go Common, you, know, you go Q-Tip, you go Anthony Hamilton. Those are people who I think kind of fall into that same always fresh, can be new, always seemingly, I guess, having meaning to what they're doing. Uh, am I reaching too far? But it seems like those are the types of people you would want to work with. Well, I mean, not only that, they're friends. They're, okay. they're people I like, you know. They're, we're like-minded in a lot of ways. People organically sound great together when their way of thinking is somewhat aligned, mm -hmm. you know. You can tell <laughs> when someone is doing a record with someone that they, they're not really aligned with because they're talking about two different subjects. Although it's titled the same thing, one can find the underbelly way of talking about it and the other one can find the, the rising moments of it. And it just feels a little awkward, like, hmm, it just feels like patchwork on this record. Right. Well, with this particular album, it's going to feel extremely cohesive because I'm working with the people that I not only like, but love. I care what happens to them. I mean, overall, I care what happens to people, but I'm saying, generally speaking, these are my kinfolk. Interestingly enough, Ghostface Killer is on one of the songs, mm -hmm. and he and I may have met once or twice before. We've never had a deep conversation about anything um however when i when this song came to pass and i put my verse down on it and then i asked Lil mama because i feel like Lil mama is one of the most underrated mcs ever um she put a verse down on it and i thought who is the gentleman that i can have on this that's gonna just crack this thing wide open because the beat says that it needs to be aggressive and monstrous and I called up Ghostface, and he was like, you know what, Light, it is my pleasure. I've always wanted to do something with you. 
And so now I've got ghost face and we've got a, a new, you know, a new friendship on record. Coming up, most know MC Light as a rapper, but she acts, she produces, and so much more. I'd love to just see it all grow in, in an expansive way, being able to give opportunities to others to come and fit in where they feel like they can best serve. So you've done mm -hmm. the acting, uh, directing, producing, you have foundations, you did a children's mm -hmm. book. What do you see as your oh. continued growth? We have a full-fledged management and production company where we are managing talent um, on the mic and off. But then we also have a whole TV and film development side where we develop TV shows and, and movies and documentaries. And so I'd love to just see it all grow in, in an expansive way being able to give opportunities to others to come and fit in where they feel like they can best serve because that's what it's all about. It's just serving the community in a way that leads to someone being inspired to do something different, to do something challenging, or to do something that they always wanted to but uh, never had the know-how, the guts, or the gumption. Are we going to see you when the new album, are we going to see you out and about? Do you have a desire to do that too? Are you hitting the, the touring again? Oh, absolutely. I am. Um, August is a huge month for me on the East coast and I'm starting it off, um, in New York city. It's the album is called one of one and we're doing a small intimate run where it's much more of an experience to be had by the true MC light fans. And um, it's called Music and Memories. And so I'll be storytelling while I'm spitting that heat. Next, she was a hip hop trendsetter and she uses that same energy in using her voice for good. When someone has more information to make better decisions, it opens up their whole world. You're big in, into charity, have your own foundation, serve on multiple boards. Why is that so important? Well, because it's all about giving, you know, um, the best givers are the best getters. And not that I give to get, but it's just a part of the way the, system, the ecosystem works. And for me, it's always been about education. I feel like when someone has more information to make better decisions, it opens up their whole world. It knocks down the four walls and it allows them to go after what it is that they really want to see happen for their lives. The theme of the show is use your voice for good. So we ask <laughs> every single guest, what does that phrase, use your voice for good, mean to you in your life? To me, there is no subtext to that. Use your voice for good. And, and good means everything positive, uplifting, uh, everything that is the antithesis to bad. <laughs> you know, it's being able to take what it is that I have and use it for the betterment of my community and my culture. Guys, thanks so much for watching an episode of The Pulse. I admit it, I fanboy a little bit when somebody like MC Light is on the show. She's a legend and she's doing positive things. I love talking to her and I hope that you enjoyed it. A reminder, you can listen to the entire interview, all places where podcasts are available. Just go ahead and check them out. There's some cool stuff that didn't actually make it to the show that you're going to want to hear. And also, Fox Local, all of our shows, all episodes of The Pulse are right there at your fingertips. So just download the app. You can hit me up on social at Bill A Fox 29. And I leave you today as I always do, reminding you whenever you can to use your voice for good and have a good one.